So now we want to calculate the the limits using the laws of limits. Um, the idea is that we don't want to uh, recall how the kind of discussion we did earlier on how to find the limit. Some of it involved basically. So recall when we're doing limit as x goes to two of x squared minus x minus two upon x minus two. We basically found out this limit by going closer and closer to. So we took x was 1.9, 1.99, and 1.99. And then we went x going to 2.01, 2.001, 2.0001. So the idea was we went closer and closer to to uh, to two, and we tried to see where our f of x goes. If you recall, this was 2.9, 2.99, 2.999, 2 and here we had 3.01. 3.001 and 3.0001, right? So this is how we found out the limit. But now we want to basically come up with laws of limits so that we can calculate limits without going through this and have certain laws so that calculating limit becomes more easier in some sense or less tedious. So the motivating example is here. We want to find out limit as t goes to zero of square root of t plus nine minus three divided by three. So for that, we have the following limit laws. So let C be a constant and limit at x goes to a f of x and limit at x goes to a g of x exist. Then we have the following limit as x goes to a fx plus gx is limit as x goes to a fx plus limited x goes to a of g of x. Yeah. So if you want to look at an example, it can be limit as x goes to two of x squared plus x cubed, right? So this limit is same as limit as x goes to two of x squared plus limit as x goes to Two of x cubed, right? Which is basically two square plus two cube, right? So note that when you do this, both the limits should exist, right? Similarly, if you have a minus sign instead of this plus sign, it still works. Namely that limited x goes to a f of x minus g of x is limited x goes to a of f of x minus limited x goes to a of g of x. Similarly, if you have constant times f of x and you take limited x goes to a, the constant comes out of the limit, you have c times limited x goes to a of f of x. That is, if you have limit as x goes to, an example would be of c times x square is same as c comes out limit as x goes to 2 of x square. The same thing happens when you replace it by, by multiplication. So limit as x of f plus g instead of plus if you have mu uh, multiplication you have the same thing limit as x goes to a f of x times g of x is limit as x goes to a f of, of x multiplied by limit as x goes to a of g of x. And then the same thing can be repeated uh, with f over g, but what you need is that limit as x goes to a, g of x must not be zero. Otherwise, this thing is not defined. Same thing is true about powers as well. Limit as x goes to a of f of x to the power p by q, where p and q are some integers, is same as limit as x goes to a of f of x, the whole power p by q. So note that here, this thing here at the top, which says that this limit laws only ex exist 
for when these limits exist. Okay, so these limit laws are only true when these limits exist. Otherwise, it's not true. Let me give you an example. So we have already seen that limit as x goes to zero of absolute value of x over x does not exist. Right. Now, in one of these, let's say in B, I can have absolute value of x divided by x, absolute value of x divided by x If I do the subtraction, I'll get limit to be zero. But however, if I break it, this one does not exist, right? So the idea is that these laws, so these two are not equal, right? This is not equal to this. So you can break these things only when the limit laws. Uh, only when each of the limits exist. Okay. Now there are a few special cases of limit. The first special case is limit as x goes to a of a constant is a constant. Yeah. Now one way to see this is the following. You can think about a constant function c. So f of x is c. So no matter where you approach from, as x goes closer and closer to a, f of x is closer and closer to c, right? So limit at x goes to a of c is c. Similarly, the second one is more like a tautology. Limit at x goes to a of x is a, right? As x goes closer to a, x goes closer to a. So this limit is a. Now using the above laws of limit, so using this laws, let's try to do this problem. So we have limit as x goes to two of x cubed. So now the first law tells us if you have addition, you can break it like that. Right, so I'm gonna break it using the addition property. Limit as x goes to two of four x plus limit as x goes to two of five. Now using the part f, you can see limit at x goes to a of f of x to the power p by q is the limit comes inside the power. So this can be seen as limit as x goes to two of x, the whole power three. In this case, the constant can come out, limit will come inside and again the same power rule regarding the powers will hold. In this case, the constant can come out. And in this case, it's gonna be five. Now, if you look at the special rule A, you'll see that limited x goes to two of x is just two. So this is gonna be two Q plus three times two square minus four times two plus five, right? So, and then whatever is the answer, you can calculate the answer, which is going to be eight plus 12, 20, 20 plus five is 25, 25 minus eight is 17. However, the answer, the final answer is not that important. Uh, you should note the following. If you look at this function, this is a polynomial function, right? And when you took the limit, it was as if you substituted two in it, yeah? 
so you are able to substitute two to get to the to the value of the limit however if you recall the previous example from the last class actually x square minus x minus 2 upon x minus 2 here you couldn't substitute 2 to get the limit because when you substitute 2 it's of 0 or 0 form so this question so this difference is asking us the following question when can we substitute to get the answer and when we cannot substitute to get the answer right so for that we have what is called a direct substitution property so direct substitution property tells you that if you take a polynomial if f of x is a polynomial or f of x is a rational function and your point a is from the domain of the function then you can substitute to get the limit what does it mean it means is that if you have to find limit as x goes to a of f of x that is going to be f of a provided a belongs to the domain of f so if f a belongs to domain of f where f is special kind of function what function polynomial or a rational function then you get to the limit directly and it's not hard to see this from from these laws okay yeah let's see briefly why is that the case so i will work it out with an example although it's not hard to prove in generality suppose i have limit as x goes to 2 of x square minus x minus 2 upon x plus 1. so in this case does what is the domain of this the domain of this function rational function is everything except minus one so two is in the domain right now if you look at the limit loss so limit of f of x divided by g of x is same as limit of f of x divided by limit of g of x if limit is x goes to a g of x is non-zero right and the denominator will not be zero at two why because it is in the domain so what is in the domain? 2 is in the domain of the function. So we get this guy we get what? We get so when you put 2 you get 0 in the bottom you have 3 which is 0. So in this case you could have directly substituted 2 to get the answer. However if you look at the other one limit as x goes to 2 of x square minus x minus 2 upon x minus 2 you have limit as x goes to 2 of x minus 2 is 0 and that is not allowed because of the denominator limit should not be 0 yeah so that is why direct substitution property works for what for uh, for the rational function Similarly, for polynomial function, the domain is all real numbers. So the substitution property works for all real numbers. Now, let's look at the following. So limit as x goes to minus 1, x plus 1 upon x cubed plus 1. So here, you notice that you cannot use direct substitution property. Why is that? Because minus 1 is not in the domain of the function. Yeah why it is not in the domain of the function this function is a rational function and the denominator becomes zero at minus one so therefore what we cannot use direct substitution property so if you notice this is of form when you put minus one you get zero on top and you get zero on bottom that means there is a factor of x plus one which we can cancel from top and bottom so you should know this um, this is a property of polynomials that so the top is a polynomial bottom is a polynomial what is the property a let px be a polynomial and 
P of A is zero, then X minus A divides P of X. Or in other words, we can take out a factor of X minus A. So when we substitute X equals to minus one, we get zero or zero. So we need a factor of X minus minus one. So I'll write this down, although you don't need to present this as a part of solution. We need to cancel factor of factor of x minus of minus one, which is x plus one. So we need to cancel this factor from both numerator and denominator. All right. So let's see. So we already have factor of x plus one on the numerator and denominator you can see that this can be written as limit as x goes to minus one. Now we need a factorization. So on numerator we have factorization as x plus one. In denominator we can have factorization as follows. x plus one times x squared minus x plus one. So this is a factorization of x cubed plus one. Now you can cancel the common factors. This goes one times and one times. Now you can substitute minus one because now at minus one, the denominator does not become zero. So let me write down this step. So this is same as limit as x goes to minus one, x squared minus x plus one times so upon now when you substitute, you get one upon minus one square minus of minus one plus one. And that is going to be one over one plus one plus one. So one over three. Right. Now we can move to the problem of what we had as a motivation so here we have t goes to zero of square root of t plus nine minus three upon t. Now, when you put t equals to zero on top, you get what? You get, you get square root of nine minus three, which is zero. In the bottom, you have zero. So this is again zero or zero form. You need to cancel a factor of t minus zero from numerator and denominator. So there's already a factor of t in the number in the denominator. We need to get it in the numerator. And the way we'll go about it is we will rationalize to get that factor out. So let's go limit as t goes to zero, square root of t plus nine minus three, square root of t plus nine plus three. So you have to multiply by conjugate t times square root of t plus nine plus three, right? So of course you're not gonna multiply this, the denominator t with the inside part because you need a factor of t. So you don't need, you do not, you should not simplify or rather multiplied out. Multiplying by t won't be the simplification. So now you have a minus b times a plus b, which is going to be a square plus b square, sorry, a square minus b square, my bad, t times square root of t plus nine plus three. Now expand the numerator out. So limit as t goes to zero, square root of t plus nine square is t plus nine minus nine divided by t times square root of t plus nine plus three. Now this nine and minus nine will cancel out each other. We'll be left out with t goes to zero, t upon t times square root of t plus nine plus three. Now these t's can cancel out. 
T one zero one zero, and now when you put when you put T equals to zero, what do you get? One upon square root of T plus nine. So square root of nine plus three, which is going to be one over six. So this is how you go about the limit of this guy. Now let's move on to the next problem. Limit at h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h if f of x equals to x square. Yeah. So first of all, f of x equals to x square. Then f of box is equal to box square. So whatever you put inside the box, right? So this limit can be seen as limit as h goes to zero. F of x is equal to x square. So f of x plus h is going to be x plus h the whole square. Yeah, in this box you put x plus h. So you get x plus h the whole square minus x square by h. So this is your limit you want to simplify or calculate the limit. So now you have a square minus b square. So you can use a square minus b square formula. So you get a, which is x plus h plus b times a minus b so you can cancel off these guys h will go one time after the cancellation is done so you're left with what you're left with limit as h goes to zero 2x plus h and as h goes to zero this will just go to 2x so this is the computation of limits. All right, so the next problem is, what is limit as x goes to zero of x squared by absolute value of x? Now for this problem, we have limited x goes to zero and we have an absolute value sign. So we'll try to get rid of the absolute value sign by taking left-hand limit and right-hand limit, all right? so that we can simplify the absolute value sign. And we'll see if the left-hand limit and right-hand limit, they both are equal, then the limit exists. If the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are not equal, then the limit does not exist, right? So let's see. So we have limit as x goes to zero. So we'll take left-hand, right-hand limit first x squared by absolute value of x. That is going to be x squared. Now, what is absolute value of, if x goes to zero plus, so you have x zero here, your x is somewhere here, right? Because it's coming from the right hand side. So if x goes to zero plus, we have this gives me that x is greater than zero. And in that case, absolute value of x is x, right? So this simplifies to x squared over x. Now that can be seen as, you can cancel one x from top and bottom, you'll be left with this. And as x goes to zero plus, this is going to be zero. Similarly, let's look at from the other perspective, other side, the right, sorry, the left-hand limit. So in this case, if x goes to zero minus x is less than zero, this implies absolute value of x is negative of x. So we get limit as x goes to zero minus x squared over negative x and that is going to be, you cancel the factor of 
x from top and bottom, you get to limit as x goes to zero minus of minus x, and still the answer as x goes to zero, this will still go to zero. So we can say, since the left-hand limit, I'll use an abbreviation equals to right-hand limit. The limit exists. And limit as x goes to zero of x squared by absolute value of x is indeed zero. All right. So now in this case, you could have done in a slightly more, um, so this case is special. Generally, when you're going for left-hand and right-hand limit, you have to look at on the both sides. However, in this case, uh, I will say an alternative way, or really, you can really see that this following simplification can be done right away. X squared upon absolute value of X, this can be written as x squared is same as absolute value of x, the whole square, right? Divide by absolute value of x. You cancel one of them. Yeah, and then in this case, you can argue that this limit is zero. Why? Because the left-hand limit is equal to right-hand limit. So you could have done that way too, all right? Although I prefer the first one because here you really get to see what is happening. And with this first way of dealing with it, I mean, not doing this simplification right away, uh, basically uh, leads you to uh, have a, a better insight of what is happening in the problem. Anyway, so let's move ahead. Uh, are there any questions or comments in this area? All right, so let's move ahead. You should do example 10 from the textbook. Now, this theorem says the following. If f of x is less than or equal to g of x, when x is near a, except for possibly at a, because at a, the function may not be defined even, but it says if f of x is less than or equal to g of x, and the limit of both f of x and g of x exists at a, or as x approaches a, then limit at x goes to a f of x is less than or equal to limit at x goes to a of g of x. So the idea is you have a function at a, so your function f, so you're, you have a function g like that, you have a function f like that, your your f of x, so maybe the, there's a hole here, maybe the function is not defined, right? So your f of x is always less than g of x. So your f of x is always less than or equal to g of x. Then the same thing will happen for the limit as well. That limit of f of x will also be less than or equal to limit of g of x. Now this um, innocent looking theorem has a very powerful implication. One of them is what is called a squeeze theorem. So squeeze theorem tells you the following. If you have, now instead of two functions, you have three functions. You have f of x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to h of x. And suppose limit this goes to L this goes to L as, as X goes to A. Then this guy has to go to L as well as X goes to A because it's kind of squeezed in between these two limits. So this theorem is called C squeeze theorem or sandwich theorem, okay? It follows from the previous one. So let's see. So we have F of X is less than or equal to G of X is less than or equal to H of X. So for all x near a, so, and the limits exist, there, that would mean, that would mean 
limit as x goes to a of f of x is less than equal to limit as x goes to a of g of x right using the first part here this part similarly you can apply the same thing on these two functions as well you get this limit is less than equal to limit as x goes to a of h of x now note that this limit is x goes to a of f of x is given to as l so and limited x goes to a of h of x is also given l so this would mean l is less than equal to limit as x goes to a g of x is less than equal to limit as and this limit is also l so it is both greater than equal to l and less than equal to l that can only happen if it is equal to l okay so this theorem is called squeeze theorem or sandwich theorem okay so your limit is basically limit as x goes to of g of x is sandwiched between or squeezed between limit as x goes to a of f of x and limit as x goes to a of h of x okay so now let's see how this can help us to find out to show that this limit is zero so notice the following so sine of 1 over x is between minus 1 and 1 right for all x so for all x this is true that sin x is between minus 1 and 1 except at 0 right except at 0 because at 0 it's not defined right similarly you have cos x cos of 1 over x is also less than equal to 1 and greater than equal to minus 1 so this two together will imply that minus 2 is less than equal to sin x plus cos of 1 over x less than equal to 2 okay. i mean one may argue that well okay sin x 1 over x plus cos 1 over x will never achieve minus 2 but that's fine that the values are between minus 2 and 2 now multiply throughout by x square so if you multiply throughout by x square still the inequality is maintained because x square is going to be positive now this implies now what is limit as x goes to 0 of minus 2x square that is 0 similarly what is limit as x goes to 0 of 2x square that is also 0 so therefore by squeeze theorem therefore by squeeze theorem limit as x goes to 0 of x square sin 1 over x plus cos 1 over x is also 0 yeah so this is how squeeze theorem is used yeah okay now let me give a uh, uh, example of um so you couldn't break it here by the way you couldn't break it as x goes to 0 of x square times limit as x goes to 0 of sin 1 over x plus cos 1 over x why why can't you break it because limit as x goes to 0 of sin 1 over x plus cos 1 over x is not defined yeah so you can't break it yeah so you have to go through this process 